said that this is the first generation of uh, allied jet fighters, particularly the, uh, the RAF. The engines, um, Rolls-Royce Derwent, they're what is known as a centrifugal um, type jet engine, a uh, centrifugal compressor. Different to the German design philosophy, they basically use what's known as an axial uh, flow engine, where the jet engine, the air goes straight down through the middle, basically. They use banks of compressor turbine wheels and banks of the power as well. The air goes straight in, is compressed gradually as it goes down through the engine, is mixed with the fuel, goes in through the burner pans, and then fires off. That provides the jet thrust. The turbines at the back are basically there to drive the compressor turbine wheels. The British design philosophy that was pioneered by Sir Frank Whipple was a centrifugal compressor, where instead of banks of these turbine wheels, you actually had one. It was a very large diameter, and it had these moulded protrusions that came out the front of this wheel. Very large mass. The air went into the front, but as it was uh, sucked into the engine, this wheel actually spun and compressed the air because it compressed it towards the edge of the wheel. So as it was spun outwards towards the edge of that wheel, the air was compressed. Totally different idea to the German philosophy. It then went through the flame tubes and there was another turbine wheel at the back that actually drove the whole thing. The, the design was uh, efficient for its time, but not sufficiently able to be advanced so that you could have it in the modern jet engine. So it's the axial flow engine that really is the one that, uh, that took off. And that's what you've got in all of the aircraft now, 777, uh, 747s. Basically what they are is a turbo fan where you've got a jet engine running this multiple fan at the front, uh, high bypass uh, engines. But these were the first generation of jets that uh, saw service with the RAF. The Meteor first flew in 1943, uh, very early. It was developed up through with uh, the, what they call the Halford engine. It looked very much different to the aeroplane that you see now. It was a lot shorter, it had a rounded tail, it had a funny looking canopy on the front. It wasn't a nice, beautiful bubble canopy like you see there, but it was a sliding canopy. And they developed this aircraft in secret. Um, when you had an aeroplane that uh, had to be guarded all the time, there was actually a symbol put on the aeroplane, and this was, this was one of them. Now, uh, Meteors first went into service with 616 Squadron, Royal Air Force. And one of the pilots that was assigned to this was uh, a squadron leader, Tony Gaze. And he was an RAAF uh, guy, sorry, he was an RAF pilot, but an Australian flying uh, with the RAF. He'd flown Spitfires, he'd flown them from Tang Mare, he'd flown with Douglas Barter, Johnny Johnson, and it was his aeroplane that was actually the first aeroplane to land uh, on the field at D-Day. Uh, it was actually supposed to be, it was set up to be a Canadian uh, pilot, but uh, he was flying at the time and landed and all the press uh, ran up to him and said, say buddy, what part of Canada are you from? And he said, Melbourne. known as the blue note actually comes from the cartridge and the leak ejection chutes under the cockpit from the four 20 millimeter cannons it's like when, when you blow air over the top of a coke bottle it makes a funny sound the hawker hunter does the same thing but no, in nowhere near the same league as the medium you'll see under the wings it has uh, a pair of drop tanks and under the fuselage a thing that looks like a big boat that's also a ventral fuel tank because these engines were very, very thirsty. Not very efficient in, uh, in their early days. That, um, that 
that sound is technically called an aeolian tone, but it sounds much better as the blue note. Four 20 millimetre cannons could carry, um, you see racks on each side for rockets. Each side could be fitted to carry 16 because they could go in two tiers. They could also carry bombs. If you have a look in the display hangar, you'll see how they were delivered. They were sent out on carriers and then shipped up to Japan. Now, um, 77 Squadron's base in Japan was at Iwakuni, but they'd been operating the Mustangs on the Korea Peninsula. The Meteors went to Iwakuni and it was there that they were decocooned and prepared for operations. that were assisting at that time. They were highly experienced mechanics that uh, had been left over from the Japanese Navy and the Army Air Force in uh, the Second World War. They were very skilled at manufacturing and repairing. And the Australians used quite a lot of those guys there. They, um, they referred to it as the Ichiban Jet Heikoku, which was the number one jet fighter, principally because it had two jets where the Sabre only had one. It went into combat operations uh, to perform air combat missions, uh, combat air patrols. Its performance was much lower than the MiG. The Russians decided to try and embarrass the United Nations. They were going to actually try and completely decimate 77 Squadron, because they had quite a lot of intelligence on the squadron and the aircraft that were operating with it. And they made numerous attempts uh, at air-to-air -air combat to try and completely destroy all of the aircraft of 77 Squadron to uh, embarrass the United Nations. Now, some of their pilots were World War II aces. Uh, the air regiment was actually led by a guy called Ivan Kochtul. And uh, he was an ace in World War II with 62 victories, including a Messerschmitt 262. The Russians that were flying these aeroplanes, uh, they weren't supposed to be there. It was supposed to be only Chinese and the Koreans, but it, it soon came out that you could spot guys in the cockpits that had red hair, uh, and they break into Russian occasionally. Um, they ended up with the aces of the Korean campaign, guys like um, Suk Yegan and Yevgeny Popeliev. They had 20 and 19 kills each, and uh, Suk Yegan actually shot down one meteor. There is um, evidence, photographic evidence, that's come out in the recent years since the fall of uh, the Soviet Union of air-to-air -air combat scene film of meteors being shot down by Russian aircraft. Now, although they were completely outclassed, they had a higher rate of climb than the Sabre, and so initially, uh, after they, they were taken off these air combat patrols, they were used for strip alert. That's, uh, that's quite normal operation there. Some of the, uh, the fuel when, in some of the manoeuvres gets collected in accumulators and then gets dumped overboard. Now, these aircraft uh, that were operated on strip alert were there to protect the Sabres when they took off and when they came back. They were also very, very highly successful on ground attack because of the rockets, the bombs, and particularly the four 20mm cannons right in the nose of the aeroplane. pretty hard by the Russians. Australians um, didn't let them get off scot free and a number of MiG-15s were shot down by uh, Australians. I think Gogoli was the first one to shoot an aeroplane down. But uh, this particular aeroplane is painted in the markings of a guy who uh, was flying the 77 Squadron towards the end of the Korean War, a guy by the name of George Hale. He was a flight sergeant and in those times you didn't have to be an officer to be a fighter pilot. Come back again. The 
meteors in Korea were fitted with, uh, as we said, these smaller rockets with a 60 pound head. They can be fitted with the bombs and also the, the 20 millimeter cannon. But uh, Australian ingenuity came to the fore again with uh, the design of a special type of a rocket to attack bridges. They were fitted with what looks like a 20 litre kerosene drum with a pointy end on them and filled with napalm and they were very successful against truck parks and also against bridges. Again ladies and gentlemen, just remember, use a little bit of hearing protection while the aircraft uh, catching you. things that happens to uh, prepare the aeroplane post-flight is that the seats, uh, the ejection seat pins go back in. All of the jet aircraft that fly down here at the museum are fitted with live ejection seats. It's the only non-military operation anywhere in the world where this is the case. Um, all of the ejection seats are overhauled here. Peter Pringshamba, the chief engineer for the museum, you can see the pin going in now. He is the first civilian to ever go through the Martin Baker ejection seat course and all of the seats have been overhauled down here by museum staff. They're all, uh, all maintained here. Some of the special equipment that's attached to uh, the seat that's in the, uh, in the Sabre is actually uh, overhauled up at um, Williamtown by the guys who support the, uh, the FAA teams and the Hawks but uh, all of the seats are basically uh, rebuilt down here. That's the Canberra, the Vampire, and our A37 is also the only A37 in the world fitted with uh, ejection seats.